Uh, I'm going to ask Rick to get, come up and pray before we begin. Uh, my grandfather used to tell this whole story that a, a pastor, my, my grandfather actually, you know, um, told the story where he actually walked through a blizzard to get to the church and started a fire there just in case somebody would show up. And he lived about two miles away or from, a, and from the church, and so it was like barely make it there but just in case somebody might show up. I always thought about that because they didn't have cell phones back then. They didn't even have the party lines back then. But one time there was this one guy that showed up. He told the story that a pastor said that one guy showed up, and, and uh, the guy said, well, I don't know what to do. He said, and an old farmer said, well, you know, when, when I, got, I got cows, but when only one shows up, I still feed them hay. So the guy preached his whole sermon, and he said, well, pastor, he says, when he does come, I don't feed him the whole haystack. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I always think about strange things like that. <laughs> Hallelujah. But uh, I, I'm going to do something a little bit different than I planned today. So, uh, Rick, why don't you come and we're just going to open this new year with prayer. Um, I'm with Elisa. There's just, it's automatically going to be new things. We might as well um, act like we're in charge because uh, we are and enjoy it, take a hold of it. Uh, and believe God together, amen? Anybody need a miracle this year? All right. Uh, we're going we're gonna to have some fun today. Pray for us. We erect... Oh, thank you, Lord. Father, we're just going to thank you so much that, that, Lord, you always show up. You're always there, always there for us. And, Lord, that's what a new thing to think about this year is as even in this morning, as the scripture just said to, to, com, to um, <laughs> commit your works to the Lord, and all your thoughts will be established. And Father, that just so much puts an answer into my heart and all of our hearts. That Lord, we, we dabble back and forth on the faith and works, and works without faith, and faith without works. But Father, if we commit our work to you, it's there. Our thoughts are established, and they're established in you, Lord. And so, Lord, we establish this year. We establish in our hearts and our minds, Father, that you truly are God, and you truly are the one who are going to lead us this year. And, Father, we're going to commit ourselves to following the path that you have placed before us and have anointed for our feet, Lord, and have anointed for that thing that is in each and every one of us. And Lord, even as Paul said, I have finished my course. And so, Father, we do, we run our course. And Father, as a group, as we run mm -hmm. each of our courses, Father, we know it is for a greater purpose. Together, as this body, Lord, as we go forth in this new year, Father, establishing, Father, more, stretching out those tent pegs, Father, further out, Lord, establishing areas that we haven't even been in yet, Lord. For Father, you want to stretch us and mold us, shape us, Lord. And bring us into new territory. Bring us into new things, Lord. And opening up our hearts and minds to the simplicity of your word. That it would minister each and every one of us, Father. As we shed those things, Lord, that have covered us. Lord, that we have let cover us. That we have let cling on to us, Father. That does not belong to you or us. And so, God, we do. We thank you. And I just thank you this morning, Father. Even as a song went forth, Lord, I thought to myself, Father, I shower mostly every day. But there is nothing like the cleansing and the showering of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. God, as it just cleanses and renews and, and cleans and, Father, and readies us for those things ahead. So, God, I claim that and I, I pronounce that today, that, Father, we do, we do have our thoughts established in you and all of our works are in your hands, committed to you because we know you have established them in our hearts in that way and in our walk. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, if anybody wants to move up forward uh, closer, that's good. That'd be all right. But uh, or stay where you're at and stay comfortable. Um, every time we had a Bible study and there's a storm and only a few people showed up, it's always such a rich time. And there's actually more of you showed up than I thought would. So I'm going to act like there's not as many of you. Uh, but... Uh, Oh, by the way, congratulations, Adam and Shauna. Uh, they found out they're having a baby boy. And that's exactly what I predicted, wasn't it? <laughs> when you got a 50-50 chance, you know, you got to take it when you can. Hallelujah.
Um, Thank you, Lord. You know, one of my, my deepest heart's desires anymore is I, I, I'm going to turn 58 this year. I'm going to be 59 in April. Um, been with these, you know, been to these funerals and been with these guys that are passing away at 50. And sometimes it makes you really say, what do I really want out of life? I mean, what's reality? You know, we, we, and one thing for me, uh, um, I'm not really into the hype anymore. Um, don't, uh, you know, you could have oversell me pretty easy, and, and yet I'm probably an overseller, so I probably wouldn't trust myself. And as my brother said, you know, it's really be wise for you to go back home after anything that anybody says here and go search it out. That's really wise. We listened to a guy uh, that spoke for Love and Logic uh, for the school. Deb brought it to us, and uh, I think Michelle is the one that suggested it. Really great. And he was just sharing about, you know, helping kids, and, 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 but it was really about just life. And I've got, I had to admit, you know, it's, when, when you're... When you're just kind of bumping through life, things don't matter too bad. You know, you're just kind of observing. You're just watching. But if you're an intense person, and I've been an intense person, I wanted a lot of life. I wanted to really grow. I've been pretty serious about things. And uh, consequently, you know, you, you dive in and you hook in. And uh, the scary part is if you hook into something and you find out it's wrong, it was you know, if if you just were an observer, it didn't cost you much. But if you were an intense person and you bought into it, you could lose a lot of money. You could lose, I mean, you could really screw things up. And yet I made a decision a long time ago. I was not going to be a person that sat out there and just wondered about everything. I was just going to go ahead and pick something and go with it. And uh, if I died doing it, I died doing it. But anyway, on child rearing, I was persuaded that correction needed to be done quite swiftly, quite firmly, at the given moment. I don't think it was just because that's the way it happened to me. My dad was actually quite patient. He had a process of several things he'd go through before he spanked us. My brother and I were talking about the other day, we were reviewing our notes of how he perceived it and I had perceived it, and, and uh, Dad would, first of all, yell, go to bed, boys. He'd watch his news, and then, uh, you know, and we, he knew we weren't going to go to, you know, and then he'd finally yell up when he was done with the news and we went to bed, go to bed, boys, you know, whatever. And... Uh, and we might vary a little bit of my brother and I, you know, on our memory, because... Uh, because I don't remember things very well, I guess. But anyway, when you heard Dad's bell come through his pant loops, he had a sterling tip buckle, and it would rattle when he, when you heard it go through the belt loops. It was pretty much over, as far as I was concerned. I mean, it, we were once in a while he'd put the belt back down if we got quiet, but most of the time he was on his way upstairs. We we slept upstairs, and once he did that, it was it was. Uh, it was done. And anyway, I don't know where it all came from, but then even in my study, you know, and working with animals and dogs, I thought, man, you, you got to do it immediately. And my kids aren't here today. Otherwise, I'd publicly re apologize to them. I took my kids out of church several times. While I'd be preaching, I would just leave the pulpit and go get my son and take him out and spank him. And I sat there Friday and go, I thought it worked. It brought a behavior change, but it didn't work. It was wrong. It was absolutely wrong. And I'm not sure why I'm 58. My kids are all grown. They're doing pretty good, but it still took my breath away Friday just to watch that and go, I was wrong. 
that was disrespectful, that was manipulative. That was for my sake, not theirs. But I can honestly say it, I was trying to do my best. I don't apologize for that, but I was misled, misinformed. And even though I can forgive myself, it still just is ucky inside. Anybody there? In any other areas of life? And then to look forward in life and say, what's going to happen now? And to think, to think that you're not going to... Listen, if you're hungry for God and you're hungry for God to, to reveal things to you, you're going to find out some things that you did absolutely wrong with good intentions, but did wrong. And if you're not willing to have that take place, then actually God will not reveal to you the truth. Because your heart will stop it. And so one of the things I encourage you to do is stay humble, stay teachable. And be ready to, to let some things go, as Elisa shared this morning, let, let things go. So, we've been sharing about that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Before I start, though, what if I told you that if you would do this, if you would take it, something that God would reveal to you, and you would take and meditate on it daily. I mean, do the due diligence. Not just once in a while, but really focus down on it and work at it to where it would actually radically change some things in your life. How many of you would be interested in hearing about that? Amen? How about if I said that it would take, if you did that diligently daily, it would take a strong commitment, how many of you would be excited if I still said, and it will take seven years, but you'll have the victory? How many of you would still be excited? Probably more so because you think it's probably true. The quick fix thing hasn't worked too many times, has it? Hallelujah. Let's go to John, the third chapter. I got my friend Tim and his wife Amy here and the kids. Joe, how old are you, Joe? Eight. If Joe got a hold of something at eight years old, and by the way, Joe, that's when God spoke to me, was eight years old, that he wanted me to, to be his man. Well, if Joe worked on something himself for eight years, seven years, he'd be 15 years old. Well, what if he had, really had it down? Would that be worth it? For all of us older people, we'd say, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But some of us, you know, we're saying eight more years on to 58, that means you're 65. I don't know. Is there a shortcut? Do I have to go seven years? So let's read here in John, the third chapter. Now, there was a man, uh, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The, this man came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi... We know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Notice here that we don't know anything else that Nicodemus said to Jesus other than he just said that. And Jesus, in, as far as we know, just start answering, I believe, Nicodemus' heart, even though he didn't hear Nicodemus' question. And Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again or born from above, he cannot see, say see, the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and, and be born, can he? And Jesus said, Truly, truly. And again, when you say that, he's saying, Pay attention here. Very, uh, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter. Say enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. And we've talked about this, that it is in the nature of God's creation and universe that the only way you're going to be a partaker of the family of God is to be born into the family of God. And we were born of flesh. We have to be born of flesh before we can be born of the spirit. So every time a baby is born, even in bad circumstances, I always say, you know, sometimes you say, boy, it would be better if that kid had never been born. If you never got born of a woman, you got no chance of being a child of God. 
And so that's one reason why it doesn't matter how, the, how, how somebody gets born, if it's through rape, incest, bad parenting, whatever else, I still say, hallelujah, that, cha- that kid has a chance to become a son of God. And if we understood what that meant, we would know it's worth every kind of sacrifice or pain that you could go through to get there. So Jesus went on to say that that which is born of flesh, and he was just saying that the, the nature of what God created means uh, put in place a long time ago from Genesis on that everything would reproduce themselves in like nature. We know from science now that we actually call those genes and DNA that goes in uh, to help, you know, bring about that a uniqueness to each person, but a unity from where it came from. And then he goes on, and so he said, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and we've been talking about that. Now, it's interesting. Here's one of the concepts that, that I had wrong for a long time, and most people do. At least I consider they had wrong. By the way, Deb just wrote a book. Uh, what did you call it? Yeah, what, if the cross what if the cross changed everything? And she wrote that book, and I'm about halfway through it. Um, and it's about revelations. And, uh, you know, I've thought about really promoting your book, Deb, but I really think I'd rather you not be taken to a cliff and thrown over. Um, when Jesus came with a message that the Jews did not anticipate, they got very, very angry. Uh, I anticipate that this book could make a lot of people very, very angry. Because it's saying that the book of Revelations isn't about, really, isn't about the end times. It's about the cross and what it did. It's a book that, the book Revelations means to reveal, and really what it means is pull the sheet off of something. And so it's revealing what already took place, not what was going to take place. But to go out into the body of Christ, it had been taught, used, and in, 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 uh, as we've talked about before, uh, the second coming has been a huge moneymaker. Okay, real honest. It's been a huge moneymaker and a huge manipulative thing. Um, but what she shares makes so much sense. It at least needs to be considered. <laughs> yeah. Seven years of, of uh, studying this, looking at this, and just asking the questions. And yet it, it brings so much peace just to see it. I mean, it's, uh, it's really remarkable. Um, uh, really taking it in. And, 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 and I want to also say this, you know, this, life is short, so let's, let's, let's don't play the game of just being caught up and looking good. Let's really get down and find out what works. A lot of people have the misconception that the kingdom of God is heaven. That this is how you get born again to go to heaven. How many people say, how many people witness this way? Uh, it, you know, it's a common thing. You, you walk up to people and just say, hey, if you died today, do you know where you'd go? And they say, well, I'm not, not really. And then you get to witness them. Or if they say, well, I think I'd go to heaven. Why? Well, because I've been a good person. And you explain to them that wasn't, won't cut it. And then you say, the only way you can get to heaven is being born again. It's not that I think that's wrong teaching or whatever else, but it's not accurate. I mean, what Jesus is teaching here wasn't how to get into heaven. He just said, if you're not born again, you cannot even see. That means to behold, to take a look at. Uh, let's see if I get any. Uh, to, to visit, to be admitted into, and to be a witness, and to experience it. He says, you can't experience the kingdom of God. You can't, you can't behold it. You can't walk into it. And later on, he says, you, you know, he says here in... in uh, uh, chapter 5, uh, uh, verse 5, verse 6, uh, no, 5, 5, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That means to come into existence or to exist or to take possession of. You can't take possession of or enter in to the kingdom of God unless you get born again. So, you know, we hear people, well, you, you know, the homosexual won't be in heaven, da 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 Well, you know, and really it's inaccurate. Jesus was talking about you can't enter the kingdom of God. Where is the kingdom of God and when is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is now and the kingdom of God is in your heart. It's not heaven. Uh, it is right now. It is, it, is, it is right here. And uh, 
And Jesus was answering, Nic Nicodemus was coming. I don't know what his question would have been articulated, but basically, I think Jesus picked up, he said, what do you, you know, Nicodemus saying, what is life about? Where am I going? What is, what is God? And I want to know about life. And Jesus answered a fundamental question to Nicodemus and to all of us in this discourse of saying, this is what needs to take place. You need to get born of the Spirit in order to see the kingdom of God. But you know, I, I personally kind of think you can see the kingdom of God and still not enter the kingdom of God. You know, it's interesting to me that Jesus said to you if, you, if you believe in the one that the Father sent, you will have the power to become the children of God, but you not automatically are a child of God. And so just to step back and just, we kind of say, well, you're either saved or you're not saved, but really that terminology sets us up to almost get into some real misunderstanding about God and about our life. You know, I have parents coming to me and say, just what is going on? My ki I'm a, I raised my kids to be Christian, but they're not acting any different than the world. There's, a, there's logical answers to that. Tammy was mentioning it, you know, in her sermon a while back, and let's say it again, you know, just that, man, when you got born again, you also died the same day. And then she says, you know, if you don't walk with God, that you, you and God are going to have to sort that out. I don't know what to say. You know, she kept saying, I don't know what to say about that. You and God will sort that out. But, but God sorts that out a little bit for us. You can walk, you can get born again, but not enter or possess the kingdom of God. And not walk in it. So, I'm not preaching to, to, to people that are, are, are ignorant, so, you know, but... Let's, uh, let's just review a few things, and we're going to try some. Romans 14, 17 talks about that the, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking and all that kind of stuff, it, but it's righteousness, and it's, it's having things the way they should be. And, and it's, uh, what else? It's peace. It's actually walking in peace. It's not, we're in peace, this, you know, we're in peace inside the building. You know, people say, well, I'm going to stay home, and I understand that. But, man, dear God, if I was home, I'd just be listening to the wind, and my house would be warm. But I'm here warm with you. I'd rather be here. Hallelujah. But since you made such an effort to get out through the cold, that's why I decided, man, I want to just, I want to just share with you some of the most powerful stuff that I know. And if I, I'm taking a, maybe a little bit of a risk here with you of exposing some of what I believe, and I may have to repent to you in a, a week, a month, or seven years from now, uh, but I'm going to take the risk. I hope you take the risk, but I will warn you, better search it out for yourself to make out, make these things, see if these things are true. But I'm hungry for real life, and I believe you are too, and that's why you're here. Romans 14, 17, it says, but the kingdom of God is peace. So it means you can walk in peace all the days of your life. You can walk, possess, and live in peace and experience it and be a witness of somebody who's living in peace. And that's a huge thing, isn't it? That's huge. I mean, of all the things, I would like to have money. I would like to have health. I would like to have energy. But man, dear God, peace is above everything else. That I can actually be at peace no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what's going on, even in the good times, bad times. What an awesome thing. Even, even young teenagers are looking for peace. And then it said, uh, uh, righteous peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Man, I, dear God, life is too short not to be joyful. I want to be joyful. I want to experience it. I want to feel it. I want to, and so do you. So Jesus has said, you've got to be born again in order to see these things, and you've got, to, you've got to be born of the Spirit to enter in and possess that and exist within that. I want to exist in the kingdom of God. You know, when I meet people that are just concerned about getting to heaven or not, I understand they, we all have to start someplace and then grow, but boy, you have not grown very far if your walk with God is just to get you to heaven. You just haven't grown very far. You haven't got started hardly at all. This is not about just getting saved so that you can go to heaven. This is about learn why we come to church is not so we can make sure we make it to heaven, folks. <laughs> we wouldn't need to be here. Why we come to church and why we grow is because we want to walk and literally experience the power of God every day of our life, not just once in a while. We want to walk, as we started out last year, we want to walk in the supernatural naturally. And really, more and more, I want to just say, if, it's, if you're not walking in your nature, how many of you want to be you? How many would like to just be you instead of all the pressure? How many of you feel pressure once in a while to act or perform in order to keep your job, keep, keep with people or relationship? Doesn't it get old after a while? It's like, will anybody accept me if I could just be me? 
And really, God is what Jesus is saying here, he says, the only way you can really enter the kingdom of God is if you're going to be you. And you've got to walk in your nature. That's what he's saying. It's, 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 it's imperative. that if you're going to, and, it, and the only way you can walk in the real you that's going to be living for eternity is if the kingdom of God is in you and you're walking in it. And as Deb brought out, you know, we could switch this around and say it's walking in the, walking in the kingdom, you could say it's walking in the will of God. It's walking in the will of God. Having God's plans, purposes, and ideas about everything, his viewpoints and opinions actually happening in your life. And remember, it happens here in the heart. Hallelujah. So, Jesus said things, interesting things like it's hard for people who trust in wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Okay? It is done, but it's hard for people who trust in wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It's hard for them to enter into the peace, harder to walk in righteousness, hard to walk in the joy of the Holy Spirit when you've got a lot of trust in your wealth or if you've got trust in your wealth. Um, Acts 14, 22 talks about taking possession of, your, of the kingdom. So that's what we're looking at. Now, the kingdom of God is His will, so we kind of understand that pretty simply. You know, God, the word uses a lot of different words, but a lot of times if you sit back and look at it, it just starts, starts getting simpler. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And we know because the kingdom of God's in our heart, and he's talking about not out here. We're not talking about, oh, God, straighten out everybody, fix everybody that's wrong and doing it. No, he's talking about, no, Jesus said, pray this way. Pray that the will of God starts happening in your heart while you're still here on earth. Not just when you get to heaven, but while you're still here on earth, have the will of God start happening. What is the will of God? The will of God is that we be blessed. The will of God that we walk with him in his wisdom, his righteousness, his, his clarity, with his gifts, with his power. That we walk in power. We, he never talks about us being losers. He always talks about us being winners. Amen? He always said, be successful. Man, you can't be successful unless this is inside you and walking in. You know, and again, you can't be successful at anything unless it's really your nature. You can only white knuckle it so long. And what most teaching is, is how to, how to adjust your behavior. See, that's a problem with just the correction I had towards my kids. I thought it was successful because I changed their behavior, but what I didn't do is change what was going on in their heart. I didn't help facilitate that. I just made adjust by threatening and everything else, I made adjustments, so they adjusted their, their behavior around me, but I wasn't... I wasn't dealing with where it really needs to change, them to be persuaded about what they're doing. Now, it says flesh and blood can't, I'm gonna, can't enter the kingdom of God. I think I'm going to trust that you understand that. We were a couple Sundays ago singing a song about, uh, I don't know why I can't remember songs until I try to sing them, but uh, I'll stand uh, with arms open wide. Yeah. I'll stand. And, uh, and then that whole message that Sunday, uh, when I got done, I, I was thinking about this. I was just thinking the, the benefits of being um, in the will of God, the benefits of being, so, I want to say sold out, totally committed, and I don't like that terminology because we got too many viewpoints of that. But it was interesting, during the week I was actually in, on my car uh, driving and Fred Wilson sent me a, uh, an email and he said, uh, he just said that, he said, I was just thinking that, that with, when Jen was singing that song about the benefits, no, he said the power of walking committed. I think that's what he put on it. And it was the same thought I had. There's a power that comes when you're totally committed. And he was saying about not only sport, you know, in the Christian walk, but he was a coach forever. The difference that happens when somebody's totally committed, amen? Hesitancy um, just doesn't cut it. Go to jump off a jump up with your skis, your snowboard, and hesitate. Bad news. Okay, go to jump a, a crick with your motorcycle. Not that I suggest that to anybody. Okay, but don't hesitate. If you're going to do it, do it. Um... And I was just thinking about, uh, and I really think this is what the theme for the 2014 is going to be, is if 
for you and I to take a look at the benefits of us being in the kingdom, 100% in. So, I thought I like to coin things, but we're going to coin some things. We need to be reminded. 2014, all in. All in the kingdom. All right. So the other day, I'm, I'm, um, I'm meditating. I'm spending uh, my holiday time is a lot. With well, Lisa gone, I spend a lot more time just trying to be alone with God and meditate because that's how, that's how things change. So I was just sharing with Tim and his family, and you guys all know the story, but about my family. Grandfather lived to be 108, grandma 104, my aunt's 103, my dad's 94. Everybody says, you got good genes. And I say, well, they're a little wore out, but they're okay. Okay? When you're born of the flesh, you got a program given to you in every cell of your body and in your heart. Okay, we call it DNA. Now, we know from science right now what they call epigenetics. We used to think that the genetic code was actually the brain that guided your whole life. We knew that your hair color, your, when, you're, when you lost your hair, all that kind of stuff was coming out. And so we thought if we could get into that code, you know, into that thing, we could find maybe cancer genes and et cetera, et cetera, and uh, do something to change that so that you didn't have to follow that pattern. We now know from microscopes and watching everything, you know, and I say we, obviously, I have not seen it, but I've read it. But it makes a lot of sense. We now know, we used to say that the nucleus or where the library of these genes dwell in the nucleus was the brain. But it's, it's, it's not the brain at all. It's called the library, in my opinion. It's the resource. It's got all the plans. If anything needs to be repaired, fixed, or, or done, it has every... De- you, know, you know, there's uh, 100,000 little processes happening in every cell in your body every second. And it has a plan, and it has a program to, to, design, to do that. And, and so what the brain really is in every cell is on top of the cell, there's these little feelers and antennas, and they're all reaching for signals. They're out there, you know, and I, I kind of think it's cool to think about them. Hey, what's out there? What's out there? So, and if those little antennas go up, just for instance, you can put a cell in a Petri dish and then put a toxins in, and those, even though they don't touch, and it's just one cell and some toxin over the corner, even, you can see with a microscope when you, with those feelers will feel something out there, even if it doesn't contact them, and they'll tell the cell it's a danger. And what happens then is the whole membrane of that cell locks down, doesn't let anything in or anything out. That's what we call being, you know, having your adrenaline kicked up when you get that happen in all your body, got all your cells doing that, then it's almost like, hey, we're going under protection mode, we're ready to run, <laughs> my heart's beating, you know, whatever, and, and, and so we're going to lock down because we can't afford to let something penetrate in that is going to uh, kill us, and of course, if you lock the gates, you also can't let something out, can you? What's going to happen if you stay there very long? What if we lock the doors here at the church... Nothing in, nothing out. Okay? And it's going to stink pretty soon, isn't it? It's going to get rank. It, the, the bad news is not getting stuff out is really bad. Okay? If, you know, it gets really bad. I can just tell you that. We had water problems in Vail, and I tell you, when the water doesn't run, uh, run in a, somebody's house, it gets bad real fast. Even out in the country. But the other thing is, good stuff doesn't get in. You're going to get hungry. Okay? And that's the same thing on a little bitty cell. When it, fear, when it has fear, anxiety, it's not at peace. It doesn't let things in. It doesn't let fresh water in. It doesn't let nutrients in. And it doesn't let toxins out. And guess what's happening? Sooner or later, you've you got a disease, don't you? You've got a disease. But here's the interesting thing about this whole thing, is these little feelers go out, they don't, they don't feel just the toxin and all that, they also feel for good things, and every muscle in your body, if, it feels, if, it, if calcium is sent to it, it, it tightens up, and then when it's not, it loosens up. It's pretty phenomenal just how simple, how powerful this works. 
And see what we're saying now, they used to say, well, you're just a subject to, you know, you, your gene's going to control you. But the problem with that was we thought there was this master plan inside the nucleus that just guided everything. And yes, that's true. There is a plan there. And most likely it's, the plan's going to be follow after your parents, especially if you don't do anything. But we didn't consider at all that there was all these sensories out there trying to figure out what's going on and responding and making the decisions about things. And literally, it, however they perceive things is going to control what plans the cell goes to. And inside, it, it's like that DNA is like if this is if this was your string of DNA, if I pulled this up and took all the protein off, we'd see the plants, and you could take this chunk out, or you can take this chunk out. I mean, there are really long miles long, and there was plans in there for health, and there's also plans in there for destruction. It's not given which ones that you're going to get, which ones it's going to go to. What determines a lot of it is the perception of the cell on what plans they pull out of that DNA, whether it's going to be destruction or restoration. And that's why it's so important for you. That's why they're saying stress is killing us, because stress means we're under stress. It means we're locking down the borders. We're not getting things out. We're not getting things in, and we're in a danger mode. And so we, consequently, if you don't come to a place of peace, literally, your body is doomed. That's why it's so important to take time to worship God and to get into the kingdom of God, to get into peace, so your body can get rid of stuff. And then they say the strongest signal, this is science, okay, the strongest signal that comes to these cells, that the, the one that's the most powerful that affects how its destiny goes is the feeling of love. This is science. This has nothing to do with, this is not written by Christians. How important is it to feel loved? You know, when I read that, I started saying, man, if you don't feel loved, you're not loved. Hey, God loves us, but if you don't feel it, it's not having any effect on you. If your sensories aren't out there saying, oh, I feel it. You know, people say, well, Christianity, you don't, have to, you don't go by feelings, you just go by the truth. I'm sorry, if you don't feel it, you won't get it. You got to feel it. You got to let yourself feel it. You got to get in places where you do feel it. And that's science. That's not, that's not anything else. Isn't that awesome? Okay, now let's get, come back. The Bible talks about in Genesis. Let's go to Genesis 2. Cody and Jen, would you jump up, please? Thank you. Up, up. Um, Mike and Deb, would you stand? No, you don't jump. I just said, would you stand? Slowly, Priya. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, or four. Okay, gotcha. So, the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and then he took one of his ribs, snapped and closed up the flesh place, and the Lord God fashioned a woman with the rib which he had taken from the man, and brought her to the man, and the man said, This is my, my, this is, this is, uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, ta-da, this is now bone of, uh, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. Verse 24, for this cause... Uh, this, this just seems out of place. For this cause shall a man or woman shall leave his father and, mo and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, there's a principle here. And one of the principles is... There's a, there's a, she's the principal of our school. There's a principle here that really is pretty profound in marriages. I mean, right here, Jess, I don't know, sometimes it's like baffles me. Why was that just thrown in there, et cetera, et cetera? But there's a, there's a principle that both man and woman, and if we had 
Um, Cody's, you know, mom and dad over here, it would be even a better picture. But for these two to become one and really have a good marriage, there's some, there are a couple th- two things that it says has to take place. One what? They have to leave. They have to leave. They have to send away. They have to resist. They have to um, neglect mom and dad. And then what? And then they cleave. Okay? Right, wrong, or indifferent, sometimes the best thing you do when you get married is get out of Dodge, away from mom and dad. But what if mom and dad did a lot of screwy things and wrong things and see it's affecting? They want to they leave that. They don't want to follow out just, to, you know, right? How many of you don't want to do what your mom and dad did in some areas? In some areas, so if they're here, okay. But what about the good things? What about the good things? That's a big question. What about the good things? Thanks, you may be seated. And I was meditating on this, and I got thinking, you know, everybody says, your genes are wonderful from your parents. I said, yeah. And I've gone here several times through the years, but looking at this, I begin to say, when Tammy's ministering, she says, when you get born again, the moment you get born again, you also die. Same time, unless the sea falls in the ground, dies. And so I went into heart meditation in my sauna. Those of you who know what that means, if you haven't, some great materials we have from Jim Richards and stuff, great things. That, I'm telling you, if you want your life to change, you've got to start doing some things different. And meditation is one of those. You've got to... You got you got you got skills and you got tools, but you got to master them. You can't just know about them. You got to you know you got to do them. You don't know something or understand something until you do it. And uh, so I was in meditation, and uh, I decided before I went in, this is what I'm going to do. I want to willfully, concretely, by an act of my will renounce everything I got from my parents. Which not just my parents, but my grandparents, great-grandparents, all the way back up to Adam. Because those lineages go all the way back. And there's, there's things that it's just incredible how it's all tied. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And the Bible says that flesh is not only controls the color of your hair, but it says by nature, by what was inside the DNA and in the whole makeup of it, by nature, your flesh is unrighteous. It's not the way it should be. It fell. It died. It screwed up. By nature, your children, the Bible says, you're children of wrath. Ever wonder why you get angry? It's your nature. It was bred into you. It came through the lineage. You were handed it before. You know, when ch- children have anger, it's not, it's not always because their parents did everything wrong. It was, it's in there. You ever wonder why you're manipulative? Controlling? You ever wonder how you're... Do you ever wonder how a two-year-old has the nerve to st- look right in mom and dad's face and say, No? Like, who taught you that? You been hanging around your big brother? It didn't need to be taught. It's natural. But see, our problem is there's also some things, you know, there's some good things in here. You know, it's natural. And so, like, in my heritage, it was my, I've got, in my family, there's a natural course of living a long time. And so everybody says, oh, you're going to live long. And I finally said, man, this is, a, this is bad news for me. You know what's bad news for me? I'm in the deceptive mode of thinking I got some great stuff from my lineage. I'm deceived. Because what that means is I'm going to open up to that and let that come in. But see, when I open up and let that come in, I get all of it. 
All the way back to Adam, the whole thing of being selfish and just wrong. Just wrong. And see, what we don't understand, Jesus is saying, man, if you, you want to walk in the kingdom, is there anything in the kingdom wrong? Is there anything in God's will imperfect? Is there anything there of sickness and disease? Is there anything there? Is, there is no law against walking in the Spirit because you, there, it's all good. So I'm going I'm to take you through what I was... Well, I can't take you through it. You can... Do what you want. <laughs> so, just for fun. Sit up a little bit. Take some deep breaths. You can leave your eyes open if you like to, in case somebody wants to try to hit you and you want to block it. <laughs> or you can trust and shut your eyes just to help focus. Take a deep breath. And let it out and just start, just relax. Thank you. Take another deep breath. And relax. And now this is what I did. I got to the state, the alpha state of meditation, and I said, in my heart, I said, liver, I reject the DNA, the programming that I received when I was born of the flesh. I, ne I neglect it. I leave it. I abandon it. I want you to forsake it, liver. And I want you to receive the programming the will, the plans of the DNA of our Heavenly Father that was given to us when we got born again. And then I went to my kidneys and said, I reject the programming that I received from being born of the flesh. And I cleave, sewed myself into, wrapped myself in and through the DNA that I got when I was born from above. And I saw transitions start taking place. I just saw the cells being obedient to me and switching things out. And I went to my spleen, my lungs, my heart. I got to my heart. I go, wow, I also release all hurts, all pains that I went through of feeling rejected by family, by society. And sometimes I, you know, I would have names of certain people. You might too. And I released and left, abandoned ship from. I declared the death between me, and death means separation. I declared a separation between my heart and all the hurts that have taken place in my life. From my conception until my current experience right now being made fun of in school. Hurtful things that were said and done to me. The scar tissue. You see, when you get a scar, when you get a damage to your body physically, it changes the DNA. That's why as years go by, you have brand new cells in your skin, but the scar is still there. Why? Because... The one skin cell that was scarred to begin with, its DNA was changed, and then it reproduces itself with the changed DNA. 
And I just said, I want to, I'm changing out, exchanging all the old DNA. So, Scars, I want you to go. Because my new DNA from God has no darkness in it. Has no air in it. It is made in righteousness the way it should be and in holiness and perfect. And I release the hurts and the emotional hurts. And I accept the new plan. The new will of being at peace, being the way I should be, full of joy, happiness, and no pain. Well, go ahead and look up at me. I did that over a course of probably an hour and a half. And you say, well, do you think anything's changed? Well, I got to start. If I did it every day for seven years, I bet it would take it. I'd probably see a lot of it. But more importantly, I'm renewing my mind. I'm coming out of the, fa of the feeling of a victim. But I can tell you this, what really, really is awesome is... Jesus was crucified so you and I could be free to be us. I think all of us know people that just say, well, I'm just going to be me. And that means they're going to be a jerk if they want to be. Right? Anybody know somebody like that? Well, one thing about me, you at least know where I stand. And that means, that means you just share whatever hurtful thing you want to share. And don't give a rip about how it hurts anybody else. See, he didn't die for you and I to be free to walk in our flesh. And all that we inherited from our Irish ancestors and our Norwegian ancestors and all that. He didn't die on the cross and change everything so you and I could be free just to be jerks and, and to be, you know, whatever. that we somebody judge. He died so that you and I could be free to be brand new creations whose DNA is perfect, whose nature is kind. Not trying to be kind. Oh, I should be kinder. No, we're not talking. Don't try to be kinder. Don't try to be more loving. Be who you are. But that means you've got to know which you are you talking about. The one born of the flesh or the one born of the spirit. And the Bible says, Jesus said, once you get born again, you can see this, you can enter into it, you can now possess it if you want to, but you're going to have to do it by meditation and keeping your mind on the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the Spirit is going to bring this new life with all, kind of, all the good things, but the mindset on the flesh is going to bring death. And so really, folks, you, the only... It's all done for you except for this. What are you going to meditate on? What are you going to think on? What are you going to spend your time on? Thinking about where you were or thinking about your new man? To get up in the morning and actually look in the mirror and just say, I know I'm looking at this ugly thing in the mirror, but really it's beautiful because I am a child of God. Perfect. Hallelujah. You see, in a lot of marriages, what happens is they, they bring into their marriage the junk from both sides of the family. Because they, they, want to, they didn't want to dishonor their parents. Isn't that true? You didn't want to dishonor your parents. You want to say, well, you know, they, they gave me, uh, you know, my dad did it this way. My mom did it this way. And yet, the only problem with that is, you know, my little story is when we were making ice cream, I bought me a new ice cream maker. I think we got it for, actually for a wedding present. 
and it had a, a plastic top on top of it. And I go, man, that's cool. I love to watch the ice cream go round and round and get that air pumped into it and start freezing and s swelling up around it. And it gets enlarged that way. And man, it's just really awesome. But every time we go to make ice cream, Elisa would put wax paper on top of and then put the lid on. And I couldn't see through the wax paper. I know it's a, I mean, it was a huge issue. You know, we almost <laughs> had to go counseling over this thing. No, it wasn't that bad. It was just a great illustration, though, because it... it. But I said to her, finally, you know, finally, the man of the, man of the house that I was. <laughs> after about the third time we made ice cream, I said, really bold, but rather quite timid. Honey, is there a reason why you put the wax paper on? And she goes, and, and defense mechanism... Now, if you go ask her, she'll tell that story totally different, Okay. <laughs> I actually know she's been listening to the sermons because she told me yesterday, you got a lot of my stories screwed up, <laughs> okay? So this is my story. But I thought there was a little bit of self-defense in her voice. Well, that's, that's what you got to do. I waited until the next time. Uh, no, I, I finally said, well, is there a reason why, though, honey? I don't know. Mom just did That's the way we did it every time. So I hid my heart and went away. I got down to Kansas and I asked your mom one day, I said, hey, Wilda, when you made ice cream, you put wax paper on the top. Yeah, I said, why? She said, because the lid was cracked. <laughs> and I knew it. <laughs> See, I knew it. I said, because I thought if your mom put wax paper, there had to be a reason. I said, the lid was cracked. But I didn't say nothing to Elisa until I got down there. Again, she's got a different story. <laughs> All I'm saying is, though, you want to honor your, you want to honor, you want to honor who you were in the flesh. You want, you want, you, you want to be proud of your heritage. You want to be proud of the good things you got in your life. But I'm telling you, if you want to walk in the kingdom, this is what you got to do. You got to die totally to the things of the flesh. You got to quit having pride, and you got to step, stop. You got to shut the door down to those things. It's not saying there wasn't some good. I'm just saying if you want to have a great marriage, leave mom and dad and cleave to one another and build your own life. Hallelujah. But especially in the things of the spirit, if you want to walk with God, stop trying to rehab the flesh. Stop trying to get it disciplined. And stop trying to change its behavior. Just walk naturally in your brand new man. Because in that new man, there is no wrong. There is none. All of us have behavior patterns that we can't, we can't beat. No matter how hard we try. I'm telling you, if you try to discipline your kids, sometimes you just say, well, try harder. I did. I told them, okay, if you don't have enough willpower, then my threats are going to become your willpower. Nathan said once, I'm scared to go downstairs of the dark. I said, then you're going to fear me more than the dark. It worked. He went down there, but it didn't change his nature at all. He was still scared out of his mind, but this time he just got one bigger, scarier thing upstairs than what he might be downstairs. But it didn't change a thing. And for you and I, if we will daily renew our minds to who we really are and spend time knowing who we are and start acknowledging who we really are, that our new man is perfect until we finally just walk naturally in it. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me, but let me tell you something. When I actually did it, and I'm just relating the thing with the, the, the kidneys and the liver. Not so, I mean, actually, I think, um, personally, I think it's a good idea, even the natural. Okay? But I was trying to get a picture of that so I could understand just how he's, how, in, in my reborn spirit man's heart, I love people. I forgive people easily. I'm not hurt. I'm not offended. 
I don't have to put walls up to protect myself because God's always my protector. People say, well, you know, that person took you five times. They can take me again. It doesn't matter. Hallelujah. But when I actually did, I realized, wow, sometimes it's really hard to say I want to give up. I have some good genes. Do I really want to renounce all of it? And it hit me. The benefit of being totally in. All in. Not 99%. Not 90%. All in. All in. 2014. We're going to be looking at this all year long. How do we walk in the kingdom all in, all the time? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. I sense your excitement today, Lord. I can see that after you paid such a high price for our freedom that it would bring you such joy when we enter into it. The cross changed everything. It changed even our DNA, our nature. Our habits, our behavior, everything. As Elisa was sharing, from the inside out. And so, Father, we we want to be in, all in, but that means all else has to stay out. And I pray for each one here that from Joe all the way up, an eight-year-old can understand this. That we would just simply believe you. That the cross literally did everything to make us the way we should be so that we can actually be free to be us all the time. Holy Spirit, that's our focus. If we got a focus, and I believe, Holy Spirit, that you're the one leading us and teaching us today, taking this body into this existence in the will of God. All in. All in. Amen. Thanks for coming.